Today is all about time. How much to give the UK, under what conditions, till when, and the frantic activity engendered by the clock ticking down again and again to yet another deadline. I'll get to that in a minute. But for now, I've come to the 13th floor of the European Parliament building here to take some time out from time and talk to Labour MEP Seb Dance, who considers this place one of his homes. The three flags on his windowsill speak to the kind of layered identity without which the EU couldn't even exist. Give me an emotional pitch for why this matters. It, it's about... And to you personally. Yeah, no, sure. It's about belonging. It's about being part of something bigger. Across this continent, we've had division and uh, animosity for hundreds and hundreds of years. And now we finally have a way of, of cooperating and working together and actually achieving things that are for the mutual benefit. And I think the rest of the world looks at the European Union as a model for how countries can cooperate. So not being part of that or extricating ourselves from it seems to me to be an incredible loss. If you do end up packing your bags finally and it's goodbye Brussels, mm. what will you go through your mind? I think it would be an enormous tragedy. I think it would be the start of Britain's fall from being a country in the, in the top tier of, of, of nations that, that has the ability to influence and make life better for its citizens. I honestly feel that. I feel we would, we would be walking away from levers of influence, but still subject to the decisions that be made in this place. I think it would be a huge, uh, pointless tragedy. But for now, he's not even sure whether to launder his shirts in London or Brussels, depending on whether we hold EU elections or not. This is what they all really need to talk about, but they find themselves returning to Brexit like a tongue to an aching tooth, and to Brexit emergency summits like motorcades on a loop. She was never supposed to come back here, but she has because of her inability to sell her deal to Parliament and Parliament's inability to come up with an alternative. And so as she walks the line once again, asking for the same extension that was turned down just two weeks ago, it must feel like a lonely walk of shame. But she wasn't letting on. I've been clear that the UK's request is for the, uh, an extension to the 30th of June. Uh, I have been working to make sure that we can leave the European Union. Indeed, we could have left the European Union by now, but Parliament didn't pass the uh, withdrawal agreement. So we need that extra time to work to ensure that we can get a deal through Parliament that enables us to leave in a smooth and orderly way. That's in everybody's interest. I think what matters is that we are able to leave the European Union at the point at which we ratify that withdrawal agreement. That would enable us to leave by the 22nd of May. But now, more than ever before, our future rests in the hands of each and every one of these nations, including the president, who might say no. For me, for me, nothing is taken for granted, nothing. Especially when I hear these rumours of a lengthy extension. What we need to understand today is why this request. What is the political project that justifies it? And what are the clear proposals? No pressure then, Theresa May. Others were more emollient, but only just. Are you tempted to veto the extension tonight? Oh, no. I don't think anybody will veto but you have never had more power over the future of our country, you, the 27 no, leaders, no, no. than you do today. Your country's future only in your hands. Nobody else. But you can decide it today. Oh, no. It's only up to you. What? Theresa May is just over there. Very good. And do you feel sorry for her? No. I support her because I do not uh, saw in my, at least, life any leader who has such stamina, strength and patience. You admire her? At least in this situation, yes. The big question is... Is there any added value linked to a, a longer extension? And I think that's what we have to find out during our consultation with Theresa May uh, at the beginning of the meeting. The last time she was here, she was not very convincing. There were many people in the room, maybe you were one of them, who said actually the more she spoke, the less we were convinced by what she was trying to say. But tonight there would be a second try. In the room, they were getting ready for that pitch. Last time it didn't go so well, but this time, who knows? They got the memo about what to wear and clearly found something hilarious. But will anyone be laughing by tonight? 
Well, let's talk to Mairead McGuinness. She's the Vice President of the European Parliament and the member of the Fine Gael Party. Thanks for coming back on the programme. You. you must be running out of nails to bite. Well, I am, and I hope it's warmer inside than it is here on the street. And I suppose this is a very unusual moment because we have a country, the United Kingdom, wanting to leave Europe but looking for a longer time to do the leaving. And I think a lot, there's a lot of conversation in the European Parliament about whether a short delay or a longer one is better. And I think that nobody has come down on either side. Some I thought the Irish wanted a long delay. Yeah, but I'm the European Parliament. I yes. think, yes, as, from an Irish point of view, I think from a leader's point of view, they would like to give a longer time. Mm. Uh, for this very reason, why give a roll-on date? So could it be we give them mm. the, the Prime Minister July, June the 30th and then come back again for July the 30th? That's not good for anyone. Better perhaps to give an extension for a year, hoping that everything can be cleared up perhaps within a month or two. Uh, I'm hoping that, but I'm not certain. Now, I understand that she has been talking to leaders about her talks with the leader of the mm. Labour Party. We don't know whether they're free fruitful or not, but we hope they are. But I don't think anyone expects or believes that the Prime Minister can change the mind of the House of Commons within a few weeks or a few months. So the leaders are chewing over it, as you said, the various options. The European Parliament has different concerns. Yeah. We have elections. Indeed. I will get on to those in a minute. But the last time she was in that room, the last time she addressed them, the more she spoke, the less they believed her. And I came across a lot of scepticism amongst the leaders as they walked into that room today. Well, I think... It would why wouldn't they be sceptical? Because this referendum is years ago and we had a triggering of Article 50. We had a departure date. On the other hand, to give the Prime Minister her credit, she is sticking to the withdrawal agreement which she negotiated in good faith with the European Union and still believes she can get it across the table. Europe is very clear and all the leaders are absolutely united around that withdrawal agreement. It will not change. But perhaps in the political declaration, in the future relationship, we can find words and ways to get more members of the House of Commons mm. to support what is on the table. But effectively, what might be offered tonight is a long extension with such strict conditions attached that we would effectively have representation at the European Parliament without any power. That's well, quite humiliating, isn't well, it? Well, I think if members are elected to the Parliament, elected members tend to be free to mm. do what they wish. So whoever comes from the United Kingdom, they could be Remainers or Leavers, perhaps both, they will do as they choose. I think the leaders are concerned about the business in the Council, which could be obstructed mm. if the United Kingdom were minded to do so. I don't think the Prime Minister is, but who knows, will she be there? If this goes on for many months, there's lots of speculation coming out of the United but Kingdom. But when you hear um, MPs in London saying we're going to be the perfidious Albion on speed and we're going to be a well, Trojan horse, know, does that worry you? No, that does a disservice to the United Kingdom. Mm. Can you imagine the world is watching those individuals that I won't name, making statements which are truly atrocious if they are Democrats and elected. They're schoolboy politics and they really should wise up and behave like politicians. This is far too serious for these type of comments to be made. I mean, I know that from a European Parliament point of view, we may well feel that our business is obstructed, whatever yeah. comes of these elections, but we will have to work with that. And those of us who believe in the European Union, with all its flaws, have got to be tough and defend the European Union yeah. and make it work better for the future, and I hope better for Britain. And in 20 seconds, Murray McGuinness, Ireland depends enormously on what happens in that room tonight, doesn't it? So does the United Kingdom. So but do Ireland the and the United Kingdom more than anyone yeah, else. Yeah, but I mean, we're all in this together. I mean, you floated the boat. We have to try and sail it. We're mm. trying to help the United mm. Kingdom. We want to be good friends and right. good neighbours. I think that's possible. I hope they get on with it inside. On that note, Marie McGuinness, thank you very much indeed. Well, Theresa May is expected to head straight back to the House of Commons tomorrow to tell MPs what kind of delay she's been given. If it's a long extension, she'd expect a frosty welcome from her own party. Many of her backbenchers, and even some in her cabinet, are appalled at the prospect of fighting European parliamentary elections, let alone staying in the EU until the end of the year or even beyond. Theresa May has already promised to resign if she gets her deal. But the calls from her own side for her to go, and go quickly, are increasing. Here's our political editor, Gary Gibbon. Tomorrow, back on Planet Westminster, the Prime Minister will report to MPs on what delays she's been given. Still ringing in their ears her pledge only three weeks ago that she would not countenance implementing a long extension. As Prime Minister, I am... I am not prepared to delay Brexit any further than the 30th of June. On the back benches and in government, there's a lot of speculation about how long into any extension that's granted Theresa May's premiership can survive. One cabinet minister said there's been a complete collapse of number 10. There's no plan. 
It's about getting them through the night. Time is up and I don't think anybody thinks time's not up. Another cabinet minister though said, I don't think the big cheeses are going to move against her. That minister said survival would be difficult but had to be tried. I hate to say this, but the reality is if we end up going and accepting a year-long or even a nine-month extension, I think we are going to have egg all over our face and I think it's time for us to bite the bullet and say, look, we can't do this any longer, we have to make a change. Is it, is it over? Is time up? Uh, the whole thing is an utter car crash and I think what has to be established now is I think the Cabinet has to have a moment with the Prime Minister and say, this can't go on, I'm afraid. It really can't go on. Yes, if three quarters of the Cabinet went and said, either you leave or we leave, uh, that would force her out. But that's not going to happen. Uh, there are only, as they say, four or five members of the Cabinet who conceivably could uh, come together to try and ask her to leave. And she would just say, well, thank you very much for your service and replace them the next day. And it, nothing would change. You know, there's Chris Grayling, there's Liam Fox, there's Andrea Leadsom, there's Penny Mordaunt. Who else is there? Many Tory MPs fear a long extension would mean European elections. They would see Nigel Farage repeat his triumph for five years ago, this time with his new You've Brexit party mark. rather than UKIP. You ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you. We'll have an eruption. And you'll see all these other parties arising too and chaos in terms of a Euro election. We simply cannot fight the Euro elections. This would be an utter disaster for us. Nonetheless, if they go ahead, then we'll have to take our punishment. And you think that could be very severe? I think punishment. it could be very severe, yeah. Very severe. Whatever Theresa May comes back with, Simon Clark, like many Tory MPs, has his eye on who will follow her. I think the public will feel very, 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 very uh, let down that we've ended up in a long extension. It's not what we want, in fairness, it's not what the Prime Minister wants, but it is nonetheless where we're likely to find ourselves. And, you and might be looking, we would need a change of direction. And you might be looking for a new leader who is perhaps more inclined to leave with no deal. That's right. Or to try and reopen the talks in some way, but realistically, I think the choice might well turn out to be uh, no deal. Several MPs, Labour and Conservatives, said there was a zombie quality to life at the moment in the House of Commons, going round and round the voting lobbies to no clear purpose and with no clear plan. But one Cabinet Minister warned people might look back at this period with some nostalgia. The Minister said it's going to be Rob or Boris replacing her. By the autumn, we'll be in a massive trade war with Europe. We will look back at this spring as a time of halcyon calm. Gary Gibbon, Channel 4 News, Westminster. Well, joining me now are two NEPs who both represent North West England. Sajid Karim is a pro-EU Conservative. Stephen Wolfe used to be in UKIP and is currently sitting as an independent and now intends to join Nigel Farage's new Brexit party. Welcome to you both. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Sajid Karim. If you take part, if we take part in the European parliamentary elections, the Tories will be pummeled, won't they? It is going to be a very challenging and difficult election for us, but it is a procedural requirement and it's only right that we, as a country, whilst we are members, we fulfil all of the obligations that we are required to fulfil. I'm not looking forward to the campaign. But I was going to say. But, but it has to be done. This is democracy in action. Right. What's your message going to be? Uh, quite clear and very straightforward that now is the time to hold our nerve, let the adults make the decisions rather than be guided by emotions, and let's ultimately carry on working towards what is in the best interests of the United Kingdom and the European Union as a whole. Do you even want to come back to the European Parliament? Uh, as I said, it's a procedural necessity. and as one of But the do you want to? Well, uh, uh, it's a sense of duty, really. As one of the experienced members here, having been here for 15 years, you know, there is a real need for people who know the structures of the EU to be present here to help guide us through this very difficult time. So, you know, many of us, really, there's no choice in it. You have to do it. Um, Stephen Wolfe, someone said that Nigel Farage is licking his lips about coming back to the European Parliament. Are you licking yours? No, I'm not, because I will feel that we've let down the people of Britain who voted to leave in a referendum. And to be forced into this position almost three years after that referendum does feel as though it's not only a betrayal of our own historical democratic principles, but the idea of coming back here in to challenge those in the European Union, many of us who don't want to, to see us back because we could be seen as trouble causers. Well, I mean, some, some of you have said that you will be trouble causers. So when you, you know, hear things like we're going to be like vandals or we're going to, we're going to be a Trojan horse, this is going to be the perfidious Albion on speed, you know, a fellow Tory said that. Mm. 
Is that what you're going to be? Well, I think we, we would create difficulties for the European Union. It could be possible because if, for example... Why the not Pol be constructive? Well, this is democracy, as Saj has just said. There will be two different sides that are going on. And if there is 160, 170 Eurosceptics from different countries joining and we add our voice to that, they will also have a kind of vision of what they want to happen in the European Union. If, for example, they want to block legislation, then it's possible that could happen. Have you actually done anything constructive in your time in the European Parliament, apart from saying no? Well, apart from trying to turn this phone off whilst yeah. I'm actually talking to you, actually, yes. Uh, no, I, I've worked in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee. I brought in uh, a, a meeting with the President Bio of Sierra Leone, okay. trying to link in businesses, not only in Europe, but also the UK. We've worked with other parties too, and other people have said I have been constructive in the way that I've actually taken on my role in this. And I believe I've been yeah. constructive in taking the debate forward yeah. in, in, in terms of what we did in the European elections and referendum. Right. I mean, are you embarrassed by, you know, the words of your fellow Tory MP, uh, Marc François, that you're going to be, uh, what was it, uh, perfidious Albion uh, on speed? I mean, that's a ridiculous thing to say, isn't it? Well, as I said, it's important that we allow the grown-ups to make the, the running and the decisions here. And I hope that's what's going to happen in the room this evening. There is clearly a need for more time to be given to the United Kingdom because at the end of the day the EU's position is clear what we need is for a united position from London to come forward that doesn't exist at the moment uh, and that's where the government and opposition really are required to come together and you know the people of the United Kingdom on a whole want to see the politicians working together now that happens needs to happen in London before it can happen yes, here. but the politicians are saying things that are quite frankly pretty shameful and they're going down really badly here and at the end of the day whatever happens we still need to make a deal with these people in Brussels. Yeah I mean that's why it's thoroughly irresponsible behaviour and it's been done for a reason because it simply wants to wind people up and as I say thankfully we're dealing here with mature European politicians who know the game that some of these individuals are playing so it's going to get short sharp shrift it's not going to get anywhere they can carry on with their nonsense tactics it means nothing in reality. Stephen Wolf, how will you make mince of Sajid Karim in the campaign? <laughs> I think he's going to put... Uh, the public themselves are going to actually make mincemeat of the Conservative Party. But because what would you say? What's your message going to be? My message is very clear, that if you, you wanted to have a Brexit, you've been denied that Brexit. The Brexit Party under Nigel Farage will actually challenge the European Union once again to say, it's time to let us go. Let us remove ourselves from the shackles. And if the Conservative Party are still in government, if Theresa May is still there, then the pressure points to her knowing that we can build in a general election, just as UKIP did in in 2015 to challenge him in that ballot box too. I think that could help. There's a sort of assumption that people like you, the Brexiteers, you know, whichever party you end up, you know, joining, uh, will do really well in these elections. But actually, the Remainers have also been energised by this. And, of course, the Tiggers, the Change UK party. Well, I think there is going to be a, an energising. We di were discussing that early on. I think the Remainers will be. But there's an anger out there that could push a lot of levers to coming out too. That's one of the arguments being... And there's a despair out there that could push a a lot of Remainers to go into the polls where they never have done before. Absolutely, and that's why I think if you take this refer referendum again, in a way, at, at the European elections over the decision, but I still believe, ultimately, that those Eurosceptic parties out there and the Brexit party being the one will take the lead and be able to create some difficulties for the European Union going forward. Sajid Karim, do you want to see Theresa May lead your party in these next elections, European elections, or not? Well, we first of all have got the local elections that are coming okay. up, and I've got tremendous colleagues who are facing a very but difficult Theresa May time. for the EU elections? Well, absolutely, because it comes a matter of weeks immediately afterwards, and we have got to make sure that we are in a position that the British people actually know that they have the opportunity to come and vote in a way where their message is going to be heard. I, I, and I say to you very openly, Matt, I don't know what's going to happen after the European elections. But Theresa May place. leading the charge for the Tories, yes or no? in the EU elections? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. OK. Sajid Karim, uh, Stephen Wolfe, thank you very much thank indeed. You.